Okay, welcome everybody. I am TD. I am the chair for today's session and I would like to introduce Felix and Subi. They are doing your presentation on assisted intelligence, how we map with the support of new technology. And they will have 20 minutes for presentation and five minutes for questions. Thank you. Hey everyone, I'm Serbi from Microsoft and I'm Felix, I'm of the Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team and we want to share with you the work that we have been doing over the last months um, around building tools to assist OSM mappers with machine learning technology. Okay, so artificial intelligence and machine learning is becoming more and more... Okay. So artificial intelligence and machine learning is really becoming a reality for us now, right? Since we are um, using, or people are using Alexa, Siri, and Google Voice, um, automated text translation work really well with tools like DeepL, and computer vision and image processing has really reached our devices. It is a new and promising technology, but like all other technology, it will not be the solution for everything, and there's a lot of human involvement needed to make the best out of it. Some things can be done very well, other things are really hard to do. Um, in the context of OpenStreetMap and maps in general, um, we talk about, when we talk about machine learning and assisted intelligence, we mostly refer to advancements in computer vision and um, combined with deep learning techniques. Um, this has um, become like much better than with regular computer vision than before now with those techniques. Um, but is also becoming a lot more complex. And um, I personally don't see that AI or ML is like replacing the human in any way, um, but it is definitely like a progress that we are doing in these fields of being able to detect, um, detect um, features from imagery. Um, this data derived from machine learning can actually help to assist the mapper to have a more comfortable experience and being able to focus on what humans are best at. It's like bringing in the local knowledge, check data accuracy, and improve OpenStreetMap as a whole. Our approach, therefore, is to assist the mapper not changing what the mapper is doing and not taking away the responsibility of the data. For the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team and our, our um, humanitarian partners, it is important to map highly um, vulnerable areas where people have the risk to face life-threatening um, situations. And for example, when fighting against Ebola, it is essential to have information about buildings to respond to infections and take needed measures, um, like sending disinfection teams or taking care of the other people that are, are living in this house. So, um, the recent outbreak in Ebola in Uganda um, showed again the importance for the need of those building data in this region. And in addition, hot works in Tanzania also for several reasons, most prominently because of floods, hygiene issues, and spreading diseases that can happen there. Um, we and our partners are highly interested in an open data set for building for OpenStreetMap in this area. And um, so we teamed up with Microsoft and um, in order to produce an open data set derived from deep learning techniques and start testing and evaluating how these really can be used in a responsible way to assist mapping an open street map. Um, our initial goal was also to leverage OSM data for the training of the models and so we will show you in a bit how this turned out. The building blocks of our work, and this is also going to be the structure of our presentation, um, are those four. So first, we wanted to create an open um, building data set using the latest deep um, learning techniques. Um, we wanted to <coughs> build a pipeline um, to connect ML models to applications around OpenStreetMap, experiment and pilot different ways of using these predictions for um, assisted mapping, and making sure this is really important for us, that the experience of mapping with ML-derived data is comfortable, intuitive, and understandable for the people. Um, we, will, we will go now through each of these four points in this presentation, and I'm handing it over to Serbi to talk about the first building block. Great, so with that context in mind, let's talk about 
what it takes to create an open buildings data set using uh, technologies like computer vision. Um, I'll introduce you guys to some of the concepts and some of the challenges that we faced in actually making this happen in Uganda and Tanzania and share some of the results. Um, so when we say computer vision, what does it actually, uh, what does it actually require? So um, from a feature extraction point of view, if you're interested in getting buildings out of aerial imagery, um, the input would be that aerial imagery and the output would be vectorized data. The steps in between are essentially getting that input of aerial imagery, uh, running it through a model to generate um, pixel uh, classification. So you, get, you see these red uh, pixel blobs, um, and those are generated uh, by classifying each pixel on the imagery as whether it's a building or not. Once that is generated, they are not all perfect, as you can see some of the rough edges um, around here, and that's why it runs through, uh, we run it through a second algorithm which is called polygonization. What that does um, is smooth out all these rough edges and actually make those pixel blobs look like polygons. So that's the high level uh, of like what actually happens to generate the vector data. One of the big concepts is um, the training data. So what, what, does, what does training data mean then? Um, training data essentially is um, a combination or a pair of raw imagery with corresponding label mask. And when we say labeling, that essentially is um, tracing of, uh, of the outline of any in object of interest on top of the aerial imagery. Um, and it's really important to have this pair uh, together so the, so the mask, the label that is there, actually corresponds to the under underlying imagery. Uh, one without the other is not really useful from a computer vision perspective. So essentially, <laughs> there will be an image that is read through an image API, and then there is a corresponding mask, uh, and those two together are um, basically what's used to train the model. Um, and that model then is, is then uh, shown imagery from uh, places that it's not seen before, and that's where the whole scale happens. So to give you an, a context, um, in, when we started working uh, in Uganda and Tanzania, the model, uh, the training data was, uh, about, it, the imagery was about for um, 50, uh, 5,600 square kilometers. When we ran the extractions, we're talking about the area of 1.2 million square kilometers. Um, and that's the result that we're gonna share. So that's sort of the scale of uh, what computer vision does. But when we started running, so we had a bunch of experience doing this uh, in Canada and US. Um, and we thought we could really leverage that and use some of the data, high quality data from OSM to train the models. Um, but we ran into some challenges. One of the big ones um, was the uniqueness of the imagery in the settlements in, in uh, Uganda and Tanzania. So here I'm sharing an example from our imagery in the US. So on the, uh, on the right side, you see the imagery in the US. Uh, and on the left-hand side, uh, you see these interesting structures, like two cools that exist in uh, Uganda and Tanzania, not so much in the US yet. Uh, and uh, Connected buildings was another issue. So uh, if you remember, it's really, the model is just taking pixel information and classifying building or not building. So it was not a surprise that the model that was trained on US and Canada wouldn't just work in uh, Uganda and Tanzania. <laughs> okay. Um, and so uh, this, this domain switching created a lot of problem for us. Um, other challenges that we faced when we were uh, utilizing, when we initially thought that we could use the OSM data uh, for model training, uh, was the, the data itself was really good. Um, but if you remember the pair that I was talking about when it comes to training, um, it did not work really well with Bing imagery. And that was one of, the, uh, one of our inputs. And so we ran into all kinds of issue where the tiles were incomplete when, when we were aligning the label data on top of uh, Bing imagery. There were offsets. Um, there was vintage issues. And obviously, if there is clouds, um, there is no way for the model to know that there is buildings underneath it. Um, so that's why, not a surprise, <laughs> this is what we got when we ran uh, our model in, uh, in Uganda and Tanzania as our initial output. It was very spotty, as you can see, the coverage is not that great. Uh, we missed out a lot of buildings. Um, so we knew that um, to really make this work, we need uh, to retrain the model um, and generate some new data that aligns with the Bing imagery. And we did that 
with a couple of different uh, approaches to uh, for labeling. So um, we we reached out to our partners in HOT and um, sought their help in terms of getting really high quality data uh, from scratch. Um, so they were uh, they provide us excellent data, uh, but when you're being really when quality is really high, um, coverage was not that much because you can only do so much. Uh, and from the mo from modeling perspective, uh, what we found was some of the other approaches that were not uh, that superior in terms of generating really excellent quality training data um, actually worked for uh, for computer vision models. So um, the the three rows that you see at the bottom are much less hands on. Uh, especially the one where we did this binary labeling where we just exposed the data to uh, our labelers and asked them to say our, our labor and to classify whether this is a good sample or not a good sample. Um, and that was really quick and uh, we were able to generate about 245,000 labels out of that. Um, so with all this in mind, we then tr started to uh, train our model. So. Um, here are the results between what happened between first and final output. You can see how the coverage really improved. Uh, we went from 800,000 to 18 million buildings. Um, and a couple of metrics that are really important to look at um, are uh, precision and recall in the context of computer vision. Um, and precision essentially means how accurate were we. So it was a, we called it a building, it was actually a building. Um, recall is if, it, if there were 100 buildings present, how many were we able to successfully identify? Um, so if you see between the initial and the final iteration, uh, with all the uh, label data that we were able to get, uh, we really uh, got a boost in the recall. And that was really, um, that's sort of the power of what uh, human input can actually do. Um, and um, so I want to share another interesting view that we took. So, when we were uh, going through training, uh, the, the, the different iterations that we did, in the very first iteration, uh, we took data from, um, that our hot partners provided us from Dar es Salaam, very urban. Uh, the model was overfitted to urban. Um, you, you can see we got 8 million uh, results. And here we tried to, um, I'm going to focus on the polygon metrics. Uh, and here you can see how the, there is difference in urban and rural um, output. So the orange bars are essentially recalled, which is essentially a measure of coverage. Um, and you can see how in the first iteration, the rural coverage was not that great. And then we started um, going to more and more rural areas and getting data for that, exposing that to the model. And as a result, the, the recall started really jumping up in the later iterations. Um, we also experimented with some of the new technologies that are coming um, for computer vision, and that also helped us uh, make the jump between 12 to, eight, 12 to 18 million uh, buildings. So with all this data, uh, this data is now going to be made available for uh, open, uh, to be used in um, OSM or to be used in any context within, when it comes to open data. Um, Felix is now going to talk about how to, um, how to, how to have some, uh, how to actually apply this in the context of OSM. So when we started the project in HOT, um, we saw a lot of ML integration happening in parallel. And we wanted to take on the role of uniting the scattered efforts and bring that together. Um, for this, we developed the centerpiece for integrating machine learning models and application in the OSM ecosystem. And this is called the ML Enabler. Um, it is basically a programming framework to include all different kinds of machine learning models and make them available through one consistent API. Um, we see this as a registry for ML models um, that can be used by the tasking manager, but also other applications in the OSM world. Um, it is open source, it is an inclusive effort, and everybody who is working in this field, we really encourage you to, to join this and, um, and take part in, in this, because um, it makes things a lot easier. Um, to recap, ML Enabler integrates different <laughs> models into it, um, it supports different schematics. And with different schematics, I mean that it doesn't have to be only geometry. It can be basically everything. It can be any kind of calculation statistics or numbers you get from ML-derived data. 
And when you have this data, you probably want to augment it in a certain way. Augment, uh, augmenting this could mean um, to compare it with OpenStreetMap data to see what is the gap between the data that came from ML and the one that is available, or um, hitting a, a different source to get like additional information um, to the data that is present. This is then um, available for consuming applications through one consistent API. So instead of um, implementing one API for each of the models, you can basically implement one and you get the whole boilerplate of models that are available in the ML enabler. Currently, there are two ML sources in, in the um, ML enabler. One is the Microsoft Buildings that Serbi talked about. Um, this is available for several countries in the world, US, Canada, and now Tanzania and Uganda. And um, the Looking Glass machine learning models um, from Development Seed that um, is free and open source software, so you can actually use it yourself to train your models and to generate data um, and, um, and play with it and really get your hands on. Um, the third one is on its way, it's the Facebook Roads, and um, I hope that soon more models are, are going to be there. Um, please get in contact with us if you have any questions about that and you want to, to, to bring your models in. If you are a maintainer of an application in the OSM world and you want to include ML models, consider implementing one MPI instead of one for each model. The next step that we wanted to do is to see how can we actually use this in OpenStreetMap. And the first um, use of ML-derived data in the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team was this gap analysis that is available in OSM analytics. And it's comparing buildings mapped in OSM and the ones detected by an open data set from the European Commission um, called the Global Human Settlement Layer that is um, made by um, symbolic machine learning techniques. It shows in dark purple the probably missing um, areas where buildings need to be mapped. And in green, it shows two areas that we can, uh, um, we can expect that the data is more or less complete. Um, this gives everybody a good and easy overview, and it helps a lot in the coordination of mapping efforts. Um, in HOT, our main entrance for mapping is the Tasking Manager, and this is a tool for coordination of volunteers and groups that want to map an OpenStreetMap. Most of you probably know it. Um, just to quickly explain, if it works the way that um, if there's an area that you, somebody wants geodata from, um, you can like um, include, uh, yeah, define this area and Tasking Manager would split this up into tasks that then um, mappers can lock, work on it, and then later it's getting verified from experienced mappers. Um, for the ML integration and testing, we set up a playground instance, which we call the Assisted Task Manager. And um, this is, and yeah, and I tell you what we did there. Um, one of the challenges that we have in a Tasking Manager is to define a good task size. Because if it's too big, it can be very um, frustrating for mappers um, if they don't finish it up in a good amount of time. And it's, if it's very small, then um, it will, it's a lot of extra work and overhead. And actually, to know what is a good task size, you have to go into the map, and you have to know what is going on there. And um, this, um, but with machine learning, we could potentially use this data and let this to be our eyes on the map and give feedback of how complex this task and how much effort it is going to be to map it. Um, in dark um, red, you see the ones that are probably too, too high effort, and in light color, the ones that are too less, and you want to get like a balance there. So this is a similar gap analysis as in OSM analytics, and it, um, and it helped us a lot to um, get project creation a little bit um, more efficiently and in a better quality. The other showcase that we want to present to you is the open source ID extension from Facebook called Rapid. It allows previously generated data from machine learning models to be included into OpenStreetMap most used editor ID. And piece by piece, the mapper can decide whether to use or to discard each of the predictions. And step by step, they can correct the shape if necessary, classify it with OSM tags, and then save it to the OSM database. 
Um, the fourth building block was actually that we wanted to improve the user experience because it's important for us that the tools are understandable to our users, especially when introducing a disruptive new technology. For this reason, we had a deeper look analysis and um, user-focused redesign. If you are interested in this, we will present about that tomorrow at 10.30. And now I'm handing it over to Serbi to talk about our next steps. Thanks, Felix. So um, we are, I wouldn't even say that we are halfway through our journey. Like we understand there's a lot of challenges that we faced when we started working um, in Africa. And some of the ideas that we have uh, are mostly around addressing those challenges that we face. So we really think that um, the data, once it's out there, um, there will be, there's, there's a huge component of validation on that data. And we want to make this uh, virtual cycle where any feedback that comes on that data uh, gets looped into retraining the model and have that uh, virtual cycle going. Uh, the other issue that we want to tackle from a technical perspective is uh, deploying some of the technologies and experimenting with them uh, in figuring out when we move from one country to another, one landscape to another, how do we eliminate um, or uh, at least reduce the need for um, more and more targeted training data because that is very expensive to create. Um, the other uh, two, uh, two aspects that kind of go hand in hand is how do we uh, tap into the really rich and um, really good quality data that exists in OSM um, and, and figure out how to uh, really tap into the value of it uh, with the corresponding imagery um, to scale um, the, and improve the quality of, uh, of, of the output. Um, and then just have conversations around um, how, how AI could be helpful in the context of this and just continue having those conversations engage with the community. Um, lastly, I just want to introduce you guys to some of the resources that are out there. If you wanted to go uh, play out uh, with task assisted uh, uh, instances that we showed you, uh, you can go um, test the demos there. Uh, there's inf more information about the project and uh, how you could engage with us. Uh, with that, um, I want to open it up to any questions. Yes. I, can, I can leave this one here. Uh, thanks, Philips and Suvi, with the informative presentation. And we'll have five minutes questions. At the back there. Oh, it's uh, thank you for the, the work in Tanzania. In previous efforts that I've seen in Tanzania, they did um, the work was specifically excluding shipping containers. In addition to the round buildings, did you address the issue of shipping containers? Um, to should not show up as a building. I wouldn't say we have, because if you saw the recall that we have, um, I, we're at 60%, so we are missing some of the buildings still. Um, we didn't categorically exclude some of the buildings, um, but we know that the training data was, is still not representative of the entire mass, so that's, that's where we want to factor in the whole feedback loop. We really believe that that'll uncover some of the value that's still out there. Have you built one global learning model, or do you have local models for different regions with different architectures, for example? So the question is, do we have a global model, or do we have a local? Um, that's something we aspire for very much, but uh, it's not. Uh, what we're finding is that it's not that easy and simple because every time we have moved from US to Canada, Canada to um, Africa and Uganda, Tanzania as well, it's, um, it's, every time we switch the input, it's really hard and you require all that training data. Um, but we do think that with some new uh, approaches like the domain adaptation technologies that we're going to evaluate some of those uh, to figure out how we could uh, reduce the need for training data every time we do that switch. Uh, we believe could allow us to scale even more, uh, 
hopefully globally. Uh, here, I have two okay. questions. The first one is related to data. It's like, which were the common problems you found on the data set in order to be discarded from training data and sent into the machine learning model? And the second one was related to the quality control because there was like a row say that there was like a binary criteria. So which was that criteria? Is like the buildings were okay or the number of buildings were found? Could you repeat your first question? Okay. Um, which, was, which were the common problems found in the data set for the training data on the, yeah, on the building data set? Oh, um, yeah, so the problems in training data set were, uh, so the training data set was when we started, we started with Dar es Salaam, and Dar es Salaam is very, it's comparatively very urban, and um, when we started using that and uh, running the model on rural areas, that the, it did not catch uh, the buildings in rural areas, and so our uh, recall was really low. Uh, the other, um, so that there, there was a diversity issue in the training data that we ran into. Um, some of the other ones that I mentioned were uh, more related to Bing imagery. Um, so the data that we had uh, from um, from Hot Partners and OSM did not align to Bing imagery. Um, so that's where the pair thing comes into play that uh, you need to have the imagery, but also the, uh, the you need to have the true label data, but also the corresponding imagery to go together. So that's another issue that we faced. Uh, sorry, it looks like our time is over, but I think you will find the two presenters in the foyer in the breakout sessions for further questions. Thanks everybody for attending. It's, I think now it's time for lunch. Thank you.